Non, regret. Non, regret. To those who thought they could destroy you, Nadia Murad's spirit is not broken. Who do we turn to for our people's right to survive? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session on media freedom. My name's David Campbell. I'm with the World Press Photo Foundation, which is based here in Amsterdam, and it's my privilege to have been asked to moderate this session and pose some questions uh, to four very interesting individuals from different countries to discuss questions of press freedom. When I was going through my news feed thinking about this issue um, just in the last month, it's amazing the stories that have cropped up and some of them are familiar and some of them offer some slightly different angles on press freedom. I saw accounts of the way that in the Philippines, the organization RAPLA, which is a very progressive media organization, the head of that, uh, Maria Rasla, is facing persecution through the use of tax law and libel law, trying to constrain uh, her media organization. We've seen a US judge recently rule that Marie Colvin, the uh, war correspondent for the Times, was actually specifically targeted and murdered by the Syrian state in 2012. In the last month, there was an account of a Ghanaian investigative journalist, Ahmed Hussein Swali, who was shot dead near his family home in Accra, in Ghana, killed by people, uh, uh, gunmen working on behalf of people that he'd been, been investigating. And at World Press Photo, we also confront this issue with various photographers and visual journalists we work with. Last year, we saw Shahid Al Alam, a very well-known Bangladeshi photographer and activist imprisoned for 100 days. And of course, the most famous, most infamous case is that of uh, Mahmoud Abu Zaid, or known as Shorkan, who's now been in jail in Egypt for more than five years simply for photographing uh, protests in 2013. All these things are an indication of what Article 19 described as one of the most dangerous years in journalism, journalism the last year. Their report said that journalism is more dangerous and more under threat than at any point in the last decade, and 78 journalists were killed in 2018 while doing their job. So tonight we're going to talk with journalists from Iraq, Turkey, and the Netherlands to see what issues they're dealing with differences between those places, but also some similarities between different places. Let's begin with Nabil Khoury. And Nabil, if you'd like to come up. Nabil is the Iraq Program Director at the Institute of War and Peace Reporting. And Nabil was telling me earlier that uh, you are in effect in exile at the moment. You were deported from Iraq, is that correct? Yeah, but I said, that let's keep this internal. Ah, <laughs> I forgot that part. Okay. <laughs> See, we journalists, we can't keep anything. <laughs> he didn't say off the record. <laughs> okay. Um, but you, you, you, even when you're working there normally, you face personally quite some difficulties in the work that you do? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, difficulties everywhere. Yeah. Um, the job what we do, especially when we work in conflict, um, in countries at conflict, um, you know, you face multiple um, level of, of danger and, and risk and, and, and uh, you know, threat and intimidation. It's because simply uh, at these countries, people there are not embracing change very happily. So uh, they have, a, they're prone to, you know, reject change uh, uh, because, you know, it's their comfort zone uh, when you come with the new approaches and so on. 
uh, the first thing they face is like really rejection. And this is one of the lessons learned that we've learned um, that you know change must come incremental, uh, little by little, and through different means in, in order to really achieve change. If you are you know thinking about implementing programming or doing uh, responsible journalism for one year and two and expect that to have really a change, that's not going to be a, a good thinking, good planning. So it's really incremental. Um, we as a the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, we have been, I mean, we came very early uh, to Iraq in 2003. Uh, we were one of the first international organizations to jump in after the toppling of Saddam Hussein and support the media there at both institutional and individual level. Um, we have trained thousands of, you know, Iraqi journalists and civil activists and, and media institutions. But, but we still need to be there. No, we were not alone. We've got a lot of partners also doing the same thing. Unfortunately, uh, I have to say that we failed internationally to really build sustainability in Iraq at the media level that uh, forced all um, potential uh, individuals, journalists, and activists to migrate and, and work from abroad. Mm -hmm. And those who were left, who, who, who stayed in the country, Unfortunately, they, they, they face um, multiple of, you know, problems, uh, starting from being um, professional at work and, um, and also from, you know, finding good source of income. Because we as journalists, we don't just like, you know, write articles and, and do things just for, you know, the betterment of the people. We need, need to live to as well. Living. Absolutely. And if I don't have that sort of income, that, you know, forces me to really work with media institutions owned by political money or partisan money or wherever, and then at the end, I'm biased, I'm accused, I'm, I don't know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm dictated to do what I do, and that, that yeah. questions my credibility. When you, I mean, how do you think about press freedom? What do you think is the most important dimension or factor in it? Because when <laughs> we commonly think about it, and in those cases I cited, it's it's very often governments imprisoning, imprisoning mm. journalists, governments killing journalists, yeah. obviously extremely serious. But are there other dimensions that you think are significant? Is it more complex than just yeah, government I, I would, depression? Yeah, from my, my experience, and I don't know, maybe what I'm saying, what I'm going to say now at night be pleasant for many, but when we speak about freedom, we have also associated that with responsibility. So. Press freedom, yes, but also we want press responsibility. We want responsible journalism. Most, there are many now, like let's say Iraq specific, many who pretend to be journalists and act as journalists, they don't respect ethical standards and they endanger the whole mission. So then we are all seen as those and, and that we know that encourage the government to crack down on freedoms and, and, and you know, censor rights and freedom of speech and so on because of many individuals. Furthermore, uh, there are also many individuals who are within the journalistic body, they are at conflict. How can we really demand press freedom, journalistic freedoms when we are really at war and we as journalists undermine each other? I mean, the government is an enemy of Press, yes, this is known, it's nothing new. But why are we enemies of ourselves? When, when, you, <clears throat> when you say journalists are undermining each other, give us an example. What sort of things are they doing that are limiting the freedom of, of the journalists they're targeting? Uh, governments and politic, you know, politicians are really smart. We can't just, you know, um, uh, consider that they are not smart. They know very well what to do, and they know media is a very powerful tool. So first thing they do in order to, um, you know, foster their position is they go and, you know, start leveraging media resources that they have to undermine others. And first thing they do, they, they start with, you know, media institutions and, and bright journalists, like smart journalists, and they try to convert them, and then this these journalists, they start to, you know, work against the others. A uh, few journalists came into positions, like in the, you know, in Iraq, few, they were journalists, so-called independent, and in few cabinets, they were asked to take 
uh, sovereign positions, such as like military or, or security positions, and instead of facilitating the, the media role and the job and giving permissions, they were harsh on, on media, uh, more than those who were not involved in media. So what does it mean? Overall, how would you characterize the situation in Iraq today in terms of how the media can operate? <clears throat> how would you think about the level of press freedom in Iraq? I think there is um, a really um, um, a very uh, a bright light at the end of the tunnel. It's not, we cannot say that there is only media now. There is also an activism and there is a confusion between both. Uh, with the emergence of the social media, uh, the, the traditional media has retreated. Um, and, and now everybody is a citizen journalist. Um, I see that um, there is a very a positive youth trend um, uprising in Iraq, uh, and it's really uh, pushing toward change. However, there is no political or economical uh, support for that change to really continue and maintain positive. And I'm afraid if, if, uh, if this is going to be let go like this for a certain period of time, then this trend, instead of being positive, might really um, deviate into something negative that we don't wish. Uh, in, in general, after five years of decade, and this is applicable on Iraq and in many other uh, Arabic country who lived totalitarian regimes and so on. People and media and activists there, they don't know how to report life. They don't know how to report normal living. They are stuck in the conflict and war because this is what the media was feeding them and this is what the regimes was, were planting in their head that there is an enemy all the time. So they are stuck in this idea that they cannot really report peace and normal life. They just need conflict. Um, and this is our struggle. We struggle every day really to mentor them that you know, struggle and war is just a phase and things which should return to normal. And what will you do then? You don't know what to tell? There are plenty of stories from you know, normal life. So would you say having a, a, a wider range of stories and, and a more diverse range of stories is also <coughs> more positivity, part, more part positivity. of freedom itself? More positivity. Because when we speak, you know, uh, because what, what creates resilience in people? Now people in, you know, living in dire situation at conflict, you know, if you feed them with a lot of negativity, then you are pushing them to surrender. Rather, whether activists or journalists, we're pushing them to surrender to negativity, and, and, but we really need to start to um, introduce some positivity in what we do so we can encourage positive trends. And uh, Otherwise, everybody will be just reporting on negative. They want to see a scandal here, a conflict there, and you know, killing there, a bomb here. But nobody wants to really report on, on a young man or woman who succeeded in their lives despite that, you know, without any support from their family or from the state, from scratches, they built something, um, you know, that contributed to the betterment of themselves and their community as well. Mm -hmm. So these stories, unfortunately, they're not so ac attractive uh, in, in, in, in the region where I come from. Mm -hmm. What's attractive is scandal and political deals and so on. Uh, so how can we really change this? Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of young men and women, nearly half of Iraq's population is under 19. And yeah. a huge number, 70%, you told me, are unemployed. Many are people, many adults were killed. They yeah. were fuel of war, mm -hmm. wars actually. And yeah, this is the new generation. And here is the hope. And, and this hope is very nascent. I mean, of course, they, um, we, we, we sense in them that they're really prone to, li to live and enjoy life. But with unemployment, with, with, with no attention and no care from the state, what do we expect from this generation to be um, later on? You know, how, how resilient can be? How, how, what's, you know, how long their stamina can last? Do you see media in Iraq uh, addressing the concerns of, of that younger generation that makes up that yeah. nearly half the population? Yeah, we, Is it a particular challenge to do that? Um, 
We have started to plant the seed through our programming. We work mostly on uh, uh, strategic messaging to really um, address this uh, uh, and to support young voices. Uh, it's becoming a trend, but yet it needs further support in order really to, to, to foster it and preserve it and from any manipulation. Um, uh, the, the youth movements are could be, you know, positive and negative as well, because this is very nascent. This is vulnerable. It's subject to anything, uh, and you know, it requires more attention and more support. But uh, yeah, that, I see some hope there. Yeah. So to cl conclude for the for the moment, how what do you think is the best thing that you can see in the future that's going to happen in terms of media freedom in Iraq? What, what do you think is the most positive thing that's most likely? And we need to work more on foster also responsible journalism. Uh, we, we can't just uh, monitor and record violations against uh, freedoms of uh, press and other. We, we need to really also work on on creating sustainable institutions. Otherwise, we'll be just like, you know, working from abroad and monitoring this country and that country and saying, oh, the indicator of freedoms is going down. We have to speak more. No, speaking doesn't, doesn't make a lot of things. You need institutions, not just yes. talk. <laughs> okay. Well, Nabil, thank you very thank much you. for the moment. Uh, we will... Um, be having a, a roundtable discussion with everyone after we've had uh, individual contributions. So we'll be hearing more from Nabil a little bit later on. But now I would very much like to welcome uh, to the stage Fasoon Erdogan. <laughs> Fasoon is a Dutch Turkish journalist. Uh, she has been in prison in Turkey, was in prison in Turkey for eight years because of her work imprisoned on charges of leading a, quote, terrorist movement because she was the leader of a left opposition party and because of her writings on the rights of minorities such as the Kurds. She's going to give us her story uh, as a way of thinking about press freedom in Turkey and she's going to be assisted by Aktash to do a translation. altı yılında 8 Eylül tarihinde sokaktan gözaltına alındım. In 2006 in September I had been kidnapped from the street. İzmir'den alındım ve İstanbul'a getirildim. I have been taken by Izmir and brought into Istanbul. İki yıla yakın herhangi bir duruşmaya çıkmadan tutsak kaldım. For two years I had I didn't know why I was um, in prison, so there was no any trial. Daha sonra yedi yıl iki ay süren bir uzun yargılama süreci yaşandı. Yedi yıl iki ay. For seven years and two months uh, afterwards it was uh, all trial went on. E, duruşmanın sonunda, e, yargılama sürecinin sonunda e, iyi hal uygulanarak e, müebbet hapis cezası artı 789 yıl 7 ay hapis cezasına çarptırıldım. E, müebbet hapis, uh, I got life sentence and e, 789 yıl 7 ay. Uh, 780. <gülüyor> 89 Bu rakamı duyunca mutlaka uh, insanlar şöyle düşünecektir. When, I, when people hears about these numbers. E, ne yaptı acaba bu kadar uh, hapis cezasını almak için diye. Well, how did she achieve to get so such a big number? Ee, hiçbir şey yapmadım. I haven't done anything. Bir radyom vardı. Uh, I was a founder of a radio station. Ee, haftanın yedi günü orada çalışıyordum. 
I've been working there uh, seven days in a week. Radyonun hem kurucusu hem yönet- yöneticisiydim. Uh, I was the director and the founder of the radio station. Uh, bunun dışında uh, zaten uh, yargılama süreci boyunca da uh, ne polisin ne de savcının ne de mahkemenin elinde başka bir şey yoktu. And uh, also during the trials uh, at the prosecutors uh, they didn't had any evidence about that I did something different than that. Uh, Yargılama sürecinin son, sonucunda e, e, ortaya çıkan bu tablo esasında benim şahsımda e, Türkiye'deki basın özgürlüğü ve gazetecilerin, muhalif gazetecilerin e, yaşamına dair bir e, veri. This story is actually is already by itself telling uh, how the press freedom is, uh, how the situation is. Çünkü bir ülkede eğer basın özgürlüğünün, yaşama hakkının, insan haklarının, demokrasinin ve özgürlüklerin nasıl olduğuna bakmak istiyorsanız basına ve hapishanelerine bakmak lazım. If you want to know about any country, uh, how, how is the human rights, the situation of human rights and press freedom, you just need to look at the media and the prisons. Ben bir örnektim ama benim gibi onlarca gazeteci hapishanedeydi. Uh, I wasn't just one example, but there, there were many of journalists. 2016-15 Temmuz tarihindeki darbe girişiminden sonra bu durum çok daha vahim hale geldi, çok daha kötüleşti. Uh, after the coup, uh, it even went uh, worse. Oraya gelmeden önce kendi durumumdan devam etmek istiyorum. Uh, if I continue with my own story. Uh, Kasım 2013 yılında bu cezayı aldım. Yargılama süreci tamamlandı yerel mahkemede. I got punished in November 2013. Uh, 2013 Aralık ayında Türkiye'de uh, siyasal iktidar içerisinde bir çatışma yaşandı. 2013 2013 uh, December there was a conflict in the country between the uh, two big power. E, Fethullah Gülen ve Erdoğan arasında yaşanan bu çatışma uh, between Fethullah Gülen and uh, Erdoğan. E, uzun tutukluluk süresinde e, bir değişiklik yapmalarına yol açtı. E, it, the situation forced to the conflict forced them to change the long imprisonment time without any uh, without any results yasal olarak uh, bir kişinin 5 uh, yıl içerisinde yargılama sürecinin bitirilmesi gerekiyor so the, the trial any trial has to finish the case should finish in 5 years uh, in the law that's what they changed. Ama ben 7 yıl 2 ay sonra uh, cezaya çarptırılmıştım. But uh, she was uh, her case ended 7 uh, more than 7 years later. E, dolayısıyla e, hem ailemin e, yürüttüğü bir kampanya ve dayanışma hem gazeteci örgütlerinin kampanyası etkili oldu serbest bırakılmamda. So the, the journalists uh, who uh, fought for the situation against the situation and my own family uh, who made a campaign about this uh, helped the situation actually. Uh, so low change was not enough. 8 Mayıs 2014 yılında uh, tahliye edildim. Uh, 8 Mayıs 2014 8, yılında 8 of May uh, 2014 uh, 2014 she got free. Uh, dosyam uh, yüksek mahkemeye gönderildi. Tahliyeden sonra. Uh, after the freedom, uh, the case sent it to a higher court. Uh, ben de uh, Hollanda vatandaşıydım. Uh, ID kartımı <gülüyor> aldım ve kaçtım. Uh, she had a <gülüyor> Dutch uh, citizenship, so she didn't wait. She couldn't trust and she just uh, left the country. Yurt dışına çıkma yasağı vardı. She had a, actually conditionally released that she cannot leave the country. E, bu nedenle e, Türkiye'yi kaçak geçmek zorunda kaldım. Uh, she had to uh, go illegal ways out of the country. 
Sonrası zaten e, sorunsuzdu. The rest was just uh, easy after coming to. Şimdi ben e, kısacık e, Türkiye'de aslında basın özgürlüğüne ilişkin bazı küçük bilgiler vermek istiyorum. I would like to give some information about the press freedom in Turkey short information. Türkiye Gazeteciler Sendikası'nın verilerine göre 3 Ocak 2019 itibariyle uh, the Turkish the Turkish Journalist Association the, um, Ha, Türkiye Gazeteciler Sendikası. Yeah. Takbond. Yeah. E, 139 gazeteci ve medya çalışanı hapishanede şu anda. E, 139 uh, journalist is in prison now. E, hapishanelerde ise e, 264.031 insan e, 150 bin kişilik e, 200 bin kişilik kapasiteli hapishanelerde. 160. Hayır. 264.031 bin toplam tutsak tutuklu sayısı. 200 uh, 264.000 uh, people ee, in prison but the capacity of the prisons uh, 200 bin civarında. About 200.000 ee, ve e, Türkiye'de en çok yapılan şeylerden bir tanesi cezaevi inşa etmek. And that's the most common thing to do in Turkey to build a prison, new prisons all the time. Şu anda 31.442 kişi. Uh, now uh, 31.000. Fetullah Gülen davasından yargılanıyor. Uh, charged because of the case of uh, Fetullah Gülen. Uh, 9731 Hala hapishane yapmaya devam ediyorlar. They still build prisons. Ee, ekonomik kriz ve yaşam koşulları giderek ağırlaşmasına rağmen. The the economy uh, the, the conditions on economy is even going low. Ee, bütün gazetelerin e, ve televizyonların, radyoların e, muhalif olanlarını, AKP'den olmayanların kapısına kilit vurdular. All the media is actually Uh, locked by the uh, the government if they are not supporting the government mallarına el koydular uh, they lost all their valuables e, dolayısıyla e, şu anda gazetelerin manşetleri tek bir yerden atılıyor so the all the main all the mainstream media is actually making the same news as each other televizyonda program yapanlar e, yapan e, gazeteciler e, Tayyip Erdoğan'ın telefonuyla işten atılıyor. Uh, TV programmers are uh, being kicked out by their jobs with the phone of uh, Erdoğan. Sadece politik olması gerekmiyor. And it doesn't has to be political. Örneğin bir kadın dekolte giymiş program yapıyorsa. If the woman is not wearing uh, something proper. Bir telefonla uh, işten atılabiliyor. In one call she can just lose her job. Ee, son olarak e, şu anda e, e, Türkiye'de hapishanede başladı açlık grevine bir tane 24 Haziran'da seçilmiş milletvekili 93 gündür açlık grevinde. Uh, for 93 days. Uh, 93 gün. 93 gün. Uh, doing hunger strike. Uh, who was actually chosen by elections and uh, she's uh, he's in prison. She's in prison. 75. gününde onu tahliye ettiler. Uh, she got uh, 75. free in the 75th day. Uh, 300 civarında uh, tutuk, tutsak uh, 55 gündür açlık grevinde. For 300 uh, prisoners are in uh, hunger strike uh, for 55 days. Türkiye'deki televizyonları, gazetelerin hepsini tarayabilirsiniz. You may check all the TVs and radios. Bir tane haber göremezsiniz bunlarla ilgili. Uh, you may not see any news about these facts. Uh, 
basın özgürlüğü, Türkiye'de basın özgürlüğü ne durumda dediğiniz zaman bu çok küçücük bir örnek. Uh, this is just a small example if you ask a question of uh, how is the press freedom in Turkey. Teşekkür. Thank you. Thank for you. She was sentenced for advocating for minority rights, as a, such as Kurds. Sadece bir şey söyleyeceğim. Türk, Türkiye'de, sorry, Türkiye'de e, gazetecileri ya da siyasetçileri gözaltına alıp tutuklarken, ceza verirken, when they uh, sentenced uh, or arrested the journalists in Turkey, e, rejim aynen şu yöntemi uyguluyor. The rejim uh, applies this. Uh, Diyor ki sen yasa dışı şu örgütün e, yöneticisisin, elemanısın diyor. You are a member of a illegal uh, terror organization. Elinde herhangi bir yazılı belge kanıt olması gerekmiyor. They don't need any evidence to be able to do that. Terörle mücadele yasası var Türkiye'de. Uh, there is a law about this in the te terror laws. Ee, size bunu e, polis ya da savcı ya da mahkeme sizi terörist ilan ettiği zaman when you, when you are uh, when you are charged uh, or sentenced as a terrorist siz uğraşacaksınız ki ben terörist değilim diyeceksiniz. Yani e, ispatlamak zorundasınız. You need to prove Aman that you are a journalist, not them. Yeah. Thank you. Can we welcome two other people to the stage? Uh, Clarice Hachad, who's a freelance journalist in the Netherlands, and Jan Koy, who is the Deputy European Media Director at Human Rights Watch. Just come and join us. But first, just one question to Fasun. You now live in the Netherlands. Do you feel that you are free from the situation that you faced in Turkey, or do you still feel that there are constraints on you from the Turkish government, even though you live here? Uh, I can't go back to my country anymore. E, i̇ki abimi kaybettim, annemi kaybettim ama onların e, son yolculuğunda yanlarında olamadım. I lost, uh, I, my brother passed away, my mother passed away and I couldn't be there for their funeral. E, ayrıca e, sosyal medya üzerinden sık sık tehditler alıyorum. And uh, from the social media I get threatened. Hmm. Yeah, I'm just a, a, a question to you, you've heard these two stories, uh, would you say that these have common threads that you see in your work, your analysis in a whole range of other countries? Uh, well, the short answer is yes. We see this in more countries. Um, in Iraq and Turkey have bad records, of course, on press freedom. Uh, Iraq very low, and Turkey also very low, the biggest jailer of uh, reporters in the world right now. And yeah, if you look at um, reports about borders, uh, for instance, their reports, CPJ, uh, their weekly reports, yeah, paint a very dire picture. And we also, yeah, see press freedom as a very important thing to um, uh, investigate, uh, document on, in countries such as Turkey. Like um, I just brought this from the desk. Uh, it's, sil it's called silencing Turkey's media. Uh, a report we put out in uh, 2016 that describes yeah, a very bad situation after the failed coup in Turkey, uh, yeah, what, what Fusun basically gave from our own personal experience. Uh, we saw that the structural problem in Turkey, uh, far too many reporters yeah, uh, are locked up, um, the freedom of speech under threat, uh, a massive problem in Turkey. And, and as always, what we see in countries like Turkey, but also Iraq, uh, and, and to a certain extent also in, in Europe, uh, like Hungary, for instance, right now, 
uh, where yeah, independent voices are being silenced and uh, taken over by the state, Hungary, for instance. Uh, yeah, it's a canary in a coal mine, is what a colleague uh, mm -hmm. told me earlier today when we had a conversation about this upcoming uh, panel. Uh, when press freedom is threatened, uh, yeah, a country can, can quickly uh, yeah, go down uh, on press freedom, but also on other uh, things that are vital for democracy. So, yeah, that's in a nutshell what we see as trends. Yeah. Yeah. Clarice, yes. your experience working in the Netherlands. For people coming from outside the Netherlands, it ranks number four on the Press Freedom Index. It's almost at the top, it seems yes. excellent. <laughs> How would you characterize it as a working freelance journalist here? Well, I would say um, it is pretty excellent, relatively. If you hear these stories, of course, um, we don't have to deal with the eminent threats and, and um, direct physical violence or from the oppression from the government. Um, well, I would say that there are some journalists who um, uh, do have really eminent death threats, like um, crime journalists like Sean uh, van der Heuvel or Paul Fuch. You know, they, they um, should also be here, actually, I hope. Um, but uh, uh, uh, generally, we don't have to fear from the government. So, no, there's not. That's why we're probably ranked as number four. Um, but I think the, the, the uh, stifling of the press, of the, of the freedom of speech of the press, or the movement of the press can manifest itself in different ways. Um, it isn't al always in a physical way. It can al also be um, um, digitally, you know, uh, for example, which, which happens a lot. And uh, um, you just mentioned yourself that you receive a lot of uh, threats online. I mean, that, I, I feel like that's a... Um, been sort of the, the, the culture um, for uh, the past, what is it, maybe decade now that it has been increasing that there's a lot of online violence and harassment and that is a different form of uh, stifling of the, the press and the freedom of speech. Yeah. And one that I think is more um, present in countries where the press freedom generally is pretty, um, pretty okay. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that we were talking about briefly earlier was the question of economic inequality and yes. how that Plays into the plays audience. into questions of press freedom, and Nabil also mentioned it in terms of: is it possible to have a sustainable working life as a journalist in Iraq, uh, and so on? How would you yes. characterize the situation in the Netherlands? Your experience on that? Well, even here again, even if it's relatively better, um, I mean, my parents are from Liberia, so I've I've seen and and, and I've talked to and I've I have friends, journalists who work there who are in. Um, similar dire, dire situations or have been uh, during the war and even you know post-war the, the there's a like little to no press freedom in, in Liberia I, I think you would obviously know that as well that the um, it's it's difficult so I, I know these situations but um, I think uh, um, even though our situation in Europe or in the Netherlands is different they all have to do have the same root cause I think several um, which is um, Journalists don't get paid enough, first of all, for the work that they do, um, be it in a, in a post-war country or a, a, a dictatorship or you know in a in a democracy. Um, so the work isn't valued. So the the um, um, and then also next to that, the work isn't valued. I feel like there's a little solid of, or not a lot of solidarity amongst colleagues. So I think Nabil, you just said that yourself that um, within the field, journalists themselves are. Um, well, not att attacking each other or competing with each other um, because it is set, the system is set in such a way, you know, because, you know, it's a capitalist system. We have to earn money. We don't earn a lot of money. So instead of helping each other um, with the harassment, with the violence, uh, we, all, we are competing with each other instead of, you know, making a fist against whatever it is that causes this uh, economic in inequity or this um, um, stifling of our speech. Um, we're more focused on surviving. And um, I also think um, another um, uh, um, another thing that um, sort of happens then is that you also can't do your work properly when you're constantly just living from check to check, insecure about you know your your daily or monthly income, and then next to that you have to deal with um, violence, oppression, or harassment. Mm -hmm. So that that also makes it impossible to to sort of improve the infrastructure. So constraints come from many different directions, many, yes. many different dimensions. <laughs> yes, and I think we need to focus on, okay, so what can we do to, um, uh, because these problems aren't new, they just get new faces, like the online harassment that I have to deal with a lot. Mm -hmm. It's just a new face of the, of the, you know, the same problem. So, um, but 
what we've been dealing with, it's been happening for decades. So we need to think about how can we um, sort of um, um, uh, create structural impact and, and, and a different infrastructure and, and safety, also like a, not only physical safety, but also a sort of um, a safe environment for journalists to do their jobs. And um, yeah, so I think if we would focus on that, we would be, it would be a better solution than just these sort of symptoms that we're, it's like yeah. we're just um, putting, um, how do you say that, band-aids on open wounds, you know, it's not helping. Yeah. Nabil, thinking back to what you were saying in terms of Iraq and capacity and sort of the, the economic status of journalists. I mean, how is journalism valued in Iraq? Is it valued? It, it is valued. It is, it is perceived as a really powerful tool, yeah. definitely. And that's encouraging. And it's encouraging many youth to come and, and join the, the sector, um, uh, looking for fame, rapid um, gains, and so on. Um, also, if you look um, at um, international media institutions, whenever there is war, they send crews and they start to recruit <laughs> big, big, big payments. And then when the war is over, when the conflict is over, everybody's jobless. It's again, you know, they are searching for wars and conflict to cover. And when, when there is peace and stability in the country, it's not attractive for even international media. CNN doesn't send crew <laughs> if there is no war or conflict. I, <laughs> I wish they send crews when there is stability. <laughs> Again, when you send the crew and then you need locals, you need stringers and cameramen and, and fixers yeah. and so on. So that's, that's give the locals some, you know, some prosperity, but then it's gone. And then w w what do they do? And they start to really be, you know, search for jobs at local market and local market, as I explained to you. Yeah. It's, it's not even a market. Yeah. Yeah. Jan, taking kind of a global view, where are the bright spots? Where, where, where are things going well? I mean, we, we know the, <laughs> and the stories about where things are going badly are obvious and serious, but, but do you, can you identify places where things are going well and, and how they got to go better in those places? Yeah, there are quite a few places where it goes yeah. very well. I mean, the Netherlands indeed is doing very good. Uh, the Scandinavian countries that I actually cover for Human Rights Watch, the media relations mm -hmm. there, they're good, very good. Uh, the U.S. used to be very good. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, people are laughing for a reason. Uh, yeah, the president is attacking the press and has been yeah. doing that already in his election campaign and has been consistently uh, keeping that up in the past years. And that's awful. I mean, it's a threat to democracy in the U.S. Uh, and, but that can change again. Uh, we also look at it from the bright side. Uh, he lost the midterm elections in a massive way, and uh, yeah, the next president could could really also repair the situation. Yeah. That's U.S. Um, maybe I should also then still mention. Yeah, we talked about Turkey and Iraq, Turkey. Uh, the U.S. government right now, Trump is also backing Saudi Arabia. Uh, yeah, <laughs> still on the Hajogi murder. Uh, but again, there's also a positive thing there. I mean, we Human Rights Watch and other organizations are pushing for a full independent UN investigation into that murder. There's already been an investigation now uh, recently, as you may know. Um, but yeah, that should be a start. It's good, but there should be more. It should be, there should be a full transparency on what happens and uh, the persons that are responsible for that murder uh, all the way to the top should uh, suffer consequences for what happened uh, in Istanbul to Khashoggi. Yeah. yeah. Can so I also respond to sure, please. what you said? Because you said, you know, that um, that in the in in the Netherlands, good in Scandinavian countries. But um, like I said, I feel like there are new threats, like a lot of online harassment, and research has shown that online harassment has the same effects at off as offline harassment abuse. So if you're getting harassed at work, you know, physically, it it, it sort of um, um, restricts you from uh, functioning and also has like a physical and mental impacts on you. Um, um, so the same happens uh, online. I think those things are, um, it's ep epidemic, but because we're living this sort of new digital age, we don't have the, the, the, the necessary tools to deal with that. And I, I think it was maybe a, a month ago that they did this research on female journalists and politicians and that they receive abuse every 30 seconds in 2017. Every 30 seconds, a female journalist or politician is harassed twice as much if you're black, a black woman uh, a journalist or a black woman politician. And these are things that cause restriction, you know? So I think it's also, even though things are good, there are new threats 
coming up and that if we can't even we can't even deal with the with the, the old threats how are we going to deal with these new things you know so that's also something to f focus on C can i comment on that because uh, that's yeah very valid uh, information what you're giving and the dutch authorities need to really take this very seriously i mean we're doing good over yeah, over the whole range of uh, press freedom topics but yeah, this should be dealt with. Uh, what you experienced is unacceptable. Also a reason why we invited you <laughs> to tell your story. I mean, uh, yeah, people have to suffer consequences if they uh, threaten to rape people or murder people online on Twitter or on Facebook. Uh, authorities need to do something, but also these social media companies have, an, have a responsibility to act and to do something and not just sit and say, okay, mm -hmm. we just have a platform and people can do whatever they want on it. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. yeah and, and journalists themselves, I think, I think typically in, in, in um, we like to be middle of the road. Um, I'm not middle of the road. I think, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think when there's inequality or inequity, you have to, you have to speak up. You can always yeah. be like you said, you know, we're not copy machines. We're, we're not living outside of the world. We're living in it. So you have a responsibility. And uh, I feel like too much we like to be middle in the road. And I, sh I think we should meddle more. So also when it comes to our own safety, we're the ones creating the news. I mean, how is this not something that we're addressing more? So People in the middle of the road get run over. It's you not, get run it's over. It's not a good place exactly. to be. <laughs> you want to take a position on that. Which, but that brings us close. You have another role, too, in, a, in addition to oh, being right. freelance journalist. You, you are also a, a UN women's representative. Yes, yes. Tell yes. us a little bit about that and tell us about how you think those questions of gender inequality and diversity play into the question of press freedom. Um, well, uh, um, we live in a diverse society, right? And I mean, half of the world's population is uh, female, it's feminine. So um, if, if, if we live in this world and we only see the world from one perspective, um, then you're not serving your public, right? So um, that, that's part of it, that we're not completely portraying the world in all its diversity and all its layers, and that's a disservice to your public and also a disservice to yourself as a maker because then you're not challenging yourself to you know, do better or be better or um, tell different stories, but just you know, kind of reproducing the same things over and over while the world and society is progressing and you're staying behind. So we need to, you know, or, or others, <laughs> I feel like I, I try to do that constantly, to keep up with, with, uh, um, with society. And, um, so I'm UN Women's Representative, and, and because um, uh, um, I, I study journalism, I've always worked as a journalist or a columnist or you know program maker, in the, just in media, and I see that there's a, um, um, a lack of representation of, of women and different types of women also um, in, in media, um, in front of the, in, of the camera as well as behind, you know, behind the scenes in uh, positions where they have uh, power influence. And um, yeah, like I said, it causes a disbalance. And if we're talking about being balanced and, and, and, and fair and showing the world in all its layers and, and, and, and uh, representing, then we're not doing that. So that's something that, um, that, that needs to change. Yeah. yeah. Soon, I wonder if I can ask you a question. You're still working as a journalist and working here in the Netherlands as a journalist? Hollanda da gazeteci olarak çalışmıyorum ancak e, gazetecilik not, mesleğimi sürdürüyorum. I'm not working as a journalist in Netherlands, but I still go on as a journalist. Right. E, Türkçe gazeteleri ve internet sitelerine yazıyorum. Uh, I write on the Turkish uh, websites, uh, online newspapers. And are you working on particular stories, particular topics that you're investigating? Bir tanesi kadınlarla ilgili daha çok yazıyorum. Mostly I'm writing about uh, women. Bir de Türkiye'deki siyasal durumlarla ilgili. And uh, also the political situation in Turkey. And in the current work that you're doing, do you face these questions of online abuse that, that Clarice was talking about, that women journalists often face? Kadın gazeteciler aslında tıpkı diğer mesleklerdeki gibi hep ikinci planda. The women journalists uh, are always in the 
behind compared to Örneğin Türkiye'de genel yayın yönetmeni, haber müdürü kadın bulamazsınız. You may not find a director, a women director in any journalist. Daha çok muhabirlik yaparlar kadınlar. They're mostly doing reporters. Bunu yap, bu, bu durumun nedeni kadınların başarısız olması değil. It's not because the women are unsuccessful. <gülüyor> İkinci planda tutulmaları uh, ve emeklerinin sömürülmesi. It's uh, because that uh, it's the general problem uh, in the society with women. That sounds familiar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to open up for questions in in one second, but I'm but I'm now going to put everyone on the spot with one one question. If you had the ultimate power in the world and you could do one thing to improve, one specific thing to improve press freedom in your particular country or your particular domain, what would you do? Jan, you get to go first. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, make sure that human rights watch gets a lot of money, <laughs> so we can do yeah much more than we do right now already. Uh, yeah, so, to do our research, but also yeah. on press freedom. Yeah, more activism. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think uh, human rights should be um, should be taught at you know schools and in schools and and should be uh, also a natural element in the media coverage. Unfortunately, in our side of the world, whenever you see a piece or a spot of a human rights, it's always paid. It's always a PSA. It's produced externally and being brought to that institution to be broadcasted. It's never an initiative, internal initiative of the of the journalist or the desk news news desk to really go and and make story about human rights. And if they do, sometimes story about human rights. Sometimes the intentions are good, but the end up results are disastrous. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is because of the lack of the culture. It's not really enough to just monitor and report on violations. It's important to create the culture because that's provide the ground for this to live and co and, and, and you know you know be sustainable and continue to exist. Um, we, we can't just, you know, monitor and report on things that do not exist, basically. And this is what I would really do. <laughs> I don't work create with that. Create the human rights culture. <laughs> I, I would create a culture of human rights right. that it's very natural. Right. Uh, we should, you know, we should really increase awareness amongst people. Sometimes they have their rights abused, but they don't know this is abuse of their rights. Yeah. They don't know it yeah. because they've been living and they consider it's normal. This is how the regimes normalized abuse. So the abuse become normal thing. And people feel, oh, but it's fine. Um, we are OK. But they don't think that their rights were abused and continue to be abused. This is the problem. Yeah. Clarice. Um, I would say uh, create new uh, infrastructure. So that, that can mean um, create new infrastructure in a sense that there's a place for journalists to go to, to make reports. <laughs> there, it's being archived, but there are also consequences to, to whatever threats or violence they receive. But also creating new infrastructure in a sense that a new way of reporting, new way of media making, new way of uh, news making. Um, instead of, uh, um, and why I say infrastructure is because we've been talking about these things for, like I said before, for decades. And um, then you have a commission there and you have a panel talk here and there's like, you know, I mean, those, it's, it's good, but it doesn't create structural change. Um, and, and then it's just like, uh, how do you say it? In Dutch you say, there's no English translation <laughs> for that, I think. But it's like, you just, it's not, um, it's not sustainable. Yeah. So new, creating new sustainable infrastructure. Cool. And for soon? Basın özgürlüğünün herkes için olduğunu düşünüyorum. I think that the press freedom is for everyone. Dolayısıyla adalet ve özgürlük ve basın özgürlüğünün yerleşmesi için herkesin bu haktan özgürce ve eşit bir şekilde yararlanabilmesi için çalışırdım. Uh, I would work on mostly freedom and uh, for the equality. Thank you. Time for questions from the audience. One straight down the back. 
Wait a minute. I don't actually have a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's more so um, um, uh, what Nabil actually said. I just uh, want to continue on that. I'm not a reporter. I'm just, uh, I say what I think, basically. Uh, when it comes to media free freedom under threat, I think um, what you are trying to say, we got to go back to basics. So when you go to a country, uh, it's like going, if I invite you to my home, I wouldn't like it when you go out and you just report you are selling dirty laundry. I wouldn't like it at all. So I think what you are trying to say is you've got to have a bit of a balance uh, when you do uh, your reporting. It's not just uh, the war or the bad stuff, but also the good stuff that's happening. Because I do come from Singapore. I have been to the National Library recently. They have all the things about the war. And then at the end, they put a very, very nice thing, a love story that happens during the war. It is so beautiful. I was so impressed. And I was saying, there you have the war, and then you have something so beautiful. Why not? Journalism should be in that way, because uh, to know is to love. If we go to back to basics, I think um, you won't be so much under threat. You've got to go back to basics. That's human. Balance. You have you have to really because life is not only war and bad things and it's not also good and positive things. Mm -hmm. So so you have to be you have to create a balance. We as journalists we are also human, so we need to be like really what you know talk about what makes us happy, what makes us sad, how we want to do better society, what we wish good for ourselves, for our families and friends and so on. I mean, we cannot isolate ourselves from the, you know, from the, the community and from the society. We, we also need to reflect people's needs. I mean, this is journalism, you, you know. Um, and so, what are the people's needs? Do they really need to talk about war all the time? And you know, even during war, there are also life happening. So why we don't cover that as well to make the balance in our coverage? <laughs> Yeah, my boss is good at this. He's he's good. <laughs> he believes in what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> That's why he's your boss, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a boy, <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Rineke. I'm director of Radio Zamane Independent Media for Iran, and we're operating from Amsterdam. And um, you've been talking about local journalism and the importance of local journalism. And so I'm just wondering if anyone on the panel has any suggestions or tips on how we from here can support local journalists and local journalism more. How do you support them where, in which country? No, no, no, no, not in Iran specifically, but maybe Jan has um, said, um, examples. But hey, you're talking about how, uh, CNN sending in troops and then just, you know, leaving people. So one of the things that we're doing Provide is working with people in a country, but like how can we support them better, especially in closed societies? I think, if I may, I mean, it's easy. Uh, provide them with opportunity to work and commission them positively to do, you know, I think this is the best support when you offer them the job and we give them a good editorial uh, and mentoring and commissioning uh, operation, then, then I think this is a very good support for them. Identifying these individuals, of course, you have your criteria, and then offer them the job because they all need money. They need, uh, and if they are professionals and it's good to work maybe with you, maybe you are you know, a professional institution, um, they, they don't have that uh, at their h homeland. Um, that would be good. And with your you know, international standards and mentoring, you can make them better individual and then you can get the best out of them. Any other thoughts? Ben eight years in prison as a for uh, being in eight years in prison as a journalist. İçeride bulunduğum sürece dışarıda benim haklarımı savunan. While I was inside, uh, the people who were fighting for my freedom outside. Benim 
Benimle dayanışan e, gazetecilerin olması. Who supported me, the journalist who supported me outside. İnsanların e, destekliyor olması beni. E, all the people who supported from outside. E, müthiş bir moral kaynağıydı. It was, it was, a, it was, it felt really good for me. E, şu anda Türkiye ya da başka ülkelerde. Now in Turkey or in other countries. E, tutsak bulunan gazetecilerle dayanışmak. E, supporting the, the journalists who are in prison. Dayanışmayı büyütmenin çok önemli olduğunu düşünüyorum. I think that it's very important to support and be there for them. Aynı zamanda Türkiye gibi ülkelerde and the countries like in Turkey siyasal nedenlerden dolayı haber yapamayan because of political situations who cannot make news işsiz kalan and losing their jobs sürekli e, gözaltına alınma, tutuklanma e, tehdidiyle yaşayan uh, living with the threat of uh, being prisoner or being arrested. E, meslektaşlarımızın uh, all the fellows e, sesi olmak burada bizlere düşüyor. It's important to be the, their voice here. And what Fuzun says is true. I mean, you hear it all the time. I mean, Amnesty knows uh, it best, you know, uh, how it works. Uh, supporting people who are in prison, uh, going to an Amnesty office, uh, and writing cards, uh, putting pressure on governments to release people who are in prison. It really works. Uh, so support that. Do something, you know, <laughs> get out of your chair and, and yeah. go. And uh, support also financially again. Uh, yeah, unions, for instance, of uh, like... Uh, CPJ, uh, huh? um, so they can help reporters in countries uh, where, yeah, situation is very dire for journalists. So. Yeah. My question is to you, You mentioned uh, the importance of education, which I believe in, but it's a long-term process, given the situation on the ground when it comes to Iraq. Uh, I think the the only solution when it comes to conflict uh, areas. Uh, is to create a very strong, not only to conflict areas, but to uh, all over the Middle East, I would say, the MENA region. I think the best is to create a very strong uh, journalist union for, you know, to, uh, to make them aware of their rights, legal rights, and also uh, to make them respect uh, the ethics in which they will be aware of through training within the syndicate, and uh, to be abided by uh, in order that will be the condition to be a member. And I don't know what's the situation in Iraq when it comes to a, a, a, you know, a union, because that's the only thing when it comes to journalists working together, being aware of their rights, uh, respecting each other, and not violating each, uh, you know, yeah, the each situation, one's uh, right. Thank you. So the situation of journalist union in Iraq, I would say, if you give them weapons, they will start to kill each other. <laughs> I'm, I don't think a union can make a good journalist, an ethical journalist. It comes within, within us. Uh, what I meant about education, it's like our media and, and the Arab world is not educated in human rights. It's not. It's uh, illiterate. And I'm responsible for what I'm saying. They have no clue about does it, what does it mean a human rights. <coughs> in many of the TV coverage, if you want to analyze it, you see intentional and unintentional human rights violations in there. So this is what I'm saying. And, and because the, the audience is also receiving this unfiltered feed, then they are normalizing vi abuse of human rights through the media. And because the media is um, an influential tool that you know it influences people. What I'm saying, if we educate this body, journalistic body, with all the human rights principles and so on, and create a culture within, <coughs> so reporting on human rights doesn't become a burden. Because now, when you tell a journalist, "Oh, go and report on human rights," it's like, oh, oh my God, it's like this is something very difficult for them to do, because they are not used to it. And whereas human rights are normal things, that this is the basics of our humanity, right? To be, these are the basics. So they don't know how to report on that. 
I'm suggesting that we, we create culture within the journalistic body and the media so then they can feed the public with it and then these principles and ethics become very natural. Um, uh, we hear them, we talk about them every day and become natural things. And when they are violated, then we feel that, oh, that should stop. We should do something about it. Um, but union do not solve, unfortunately, many unions are under political influence and they start with good intentions, they end up with, with bad, bad performance and they do, uh, you know, bad to the journalistic body. So I don't, I don't, I don't recommend really unions. To be a journalist, you can be an independent freelancer with all the ethics and you know professionalism, and you can act responsibly. This is what actually uh, everybody must do. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, you talked about the risk you saw in terms of digitalization uh, because you saw threats towards journalists, right? <laughs> Would you also see social media as an opportunity for <laughs> media freedom in terms of, I see it bringing people together, catalyzing change movements, things like that, for example. And next to that, we also talked a lot about the good things in the Netherlands. At the same time, you mentioned, for example, Hungary and the, the changes you see there. Do you also see those in the Netherlands in terms of populist movements, for example? So, a question for India, yes. please. Um, yes, to the first question. Of course, obviously, the um, uh, digitalization, the digital age has brought a lot of um, um, yeah, good developments, uh, good social uh, developments, uh, developments for social movements, developments for uh, marginalized communities to still have a platform for people who typically um, are unable to find their way through to institutions to still have you know a, a voice and uh, have their voice be magnified. Um, but also for I think for media for and for journalists, um, uh, social media has created a place where of um, how do you say a source, a source of information, a source of stories, a source of engagement. Also, I think it's often um, abused, to be honest, by by media. So you know that's also part of it. But there, a lot of good has come out of the you know out of social media and the digitalization. But I think every everything good also has you know a counterpart, of course, and and that's something we can can't ignore. Um, and your second question was about uh, if the, the like if, if in the Netherlands the, the there was a similar populist movement as in Hungary, Hungary. for example. Yeah. I think it's you, you can see that all over Europe or even in in in, in the states, um, uh, which is by the way my, my birth country of birth. So it's it's something that I'm also uh, my family a, a large part of my family lives there. So it's uh, something I'm also invested in personally. That there is a populist movement throughout the world, and I think also here in the Netherlands, maybe not as prominent as in the States or in, in Hungary, perhaps. But I think because there's a sort of political shift going on, that it also has tainted us as a country. And um, I don't know if your question is if it has influenced media. I think it has influenced media, maybe not in a direct sense that you have. Um, um, the government um, directly influencing, influencing media or journalists, but I think the shift does influence um, um, the, the climate and the, the public debate, and that it, ha it has caused a sort of shift towards more um, yeah, problematic reporting or maybe more um, one-dimensional reporting or more populist reporting. I mean, it's very attractive. It's a very attractive thing. That's why it's called populism, and I think that journalists are often um, attracted to it like moths to a flame too much so that they forget that you know they also have a certain responsibility and I think uh, that that is definitely what you see here also but I think Jan yeah, can say more about yeah, that. Yeah we, we recognize that indeed uh, also in Holland you see that uh, um, yeah it's problematic rise of populism but at the same time we also uh, saw that it, um, basically described it in our world report that was launched a few weeks ago in Berlin uh, there's a big massive pushback actually uh, against populists, uh, authoritarians. Uh, what we see is like uh, people that rise in the streets in Warsaw and in uh, Budapest. Uh, and in the US, where you have a massive anti-Trump movement right now, um, there's also a lot of positive developments. It's yeah, not just a reason uh, gloom and doom. More women doom in Congress doom. than ever, I think, also. Sorry? Right? That they're, this year there are more women and minorities in Congress than ever yep. in the history of you know, the United States. And that's because of the pushback that you're talking about. And I hope we'll have a similar pushback here, to yeah. be honest. And that's populism and politics, but also social media. The other question you asked, 
Uh, of course, there's a lot of vitriol and a lot of awfulness on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other outlets, uh, other platforms. <laughs> but there's, there's, I would focus on the positives. I mean, the, the, you can really get a lot of people behind the cause. Uh, one example, not journalism, well, also in a way, the Safe Hakim uh, uh, campaign. Huh? Mm -hmm. Actually, put a football <laughs> at a desk uh, there. You can you can hold it up, put a photo and put your own statement for a football player who got refugee status in Australia, mm -hmm. uh, went on a honeymoon to Thailand, but was arrested there because the Bahrainis put out a red notice via Interpol for his arrest. Um, and for, I mean, Bahrain, there's, there's no rule of law there. Uh, the guy was tortured there. It's all very well documented. And he has refugee status, so he should be released immediately. But yeah, for some reason, uh, probably political, uh, he's still in prison. and. What happened in the last week, on Monday he was in court, um, shackled, uh, bare feet, an awful image uh, that went yeah. viral all over the world, thanks to hundreds of thousands of people yeah. using that hashtag, Save Hakim, uh, adding massive pressure on FIFA uh, authorities in Thailand, who are actually also vulnerable there. They, they care about their image. They want you to go on holiday to Thailand. Uh, they want the World Cup football uh, in the future. So there's a lot of pressure points and social media can really help. You can get a mass of people behind it and, and, and get impact. Uh, but also human rights, what it's all about, we want impact. We want things to change for the better. And yeah, social media can be a very good tool there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Question towards um, everybody, but uh, Clarice, you mentioned before that uh, you want to create new infrastructures. And um, I'm wondering how can we, um, including you as the media, uh, provide a safe infrastructure or like safe spaces for actors such as, um, I'm thinking Chelsea Manning or uh, more mm -hmm. currently Reality Winner, who um, got imprisoned now for five years after she uh, leaked classified documents from the uh, NSA to the media platform, um, uh, the Intercept. So basically, how can we provide uh, a safe structure for future whistleblowers as well? Well, that's a difficult question. I think, <laughs> um, to be honest, okay, I think it's not um, us as a as public that provides, or even the media that provides. I think it's the government that should provide that, and it's very problematic that that actually. They're the ones contributing to it, um, so um, we sh they should provide better laws. I, I mean, I, I think in, in Europe it would be on European level, you know, and in the States it would be yeah. But I mean, yeah. So, um, but I think what we can do is um, speak out more on, uh, about on that and um, demand more. I think because it's all information that that we consume when when we think about the um, what's it called the the the the, the, uh, the Panama. Um, uh, papers, yes. Um, every, I mean, come on, everyone knows that. You know, everyone heard about it, everyone read it. Um, so a lot of things that whistleblowers do for society and, and for communities are appreciated and are ingested, but then we don't give them the same appreciation back. So uh, even though it's not our responsibility in the sense that we can create the infrastructure, but I think we can sort of, um, um, how do you say that? Um, um, we can sort of ignite the movement <laughs> that, um, that sort of sparks the people that should create it into doing it. So I think in that way we could report more about it, we could speak out more on social media, as, as you know, and create impact. <coughs> um, so that, that's what I think uh, we could do. We have time for one final question. And support the organizations that already do, by the way, because there are organizations that are already. <coughs> you know. You need to hold it. Okay, uh, th thank you. Um, my question is for you, Nabil, in, about Iraq. Uh, you mentioned that CNN comes with loads of reporters. I just gave an example. Yeah, yeah so but uh, uh, exactly. I'm using <laughs> the same there example. There are many others. <laughs> and then they leave. Um, yeah. But I want to bring up another issue regarding the freedom for information because I lived in the US during the Iraqi war. Um, they were there, but they were embedded in tanks, and it turned into like a war movie. Not much substance. So, how do you see that? Is it's not, and it's it is happening in a country supposedly one of the best for freedom of press. 
Yeah. So what do you think about that? Well, I mean, the CNN or Fox News or any other you know, Western agency, when, when it goes to a country, of course, they like to be embedded because, because of the rule of the conflict, that they can't go alone and because, um, you know, it's, and also what to cover is also an editorial choice that they make. I'm speaking about our editorial inside the country. So what's the editorial of the Iraqi institutions, how they want to cover the, the war and, and life during the war? This is something for Iraqis to decide. And I would say it shouldn't be similar to what the CNN reporter is going to do. Of course, he, he's not from Iraq. He doesn't know the country. Maybe he made some research on Google for a few days before he went there, and they gave him a first aid kit and told him, go again in this Humvee and cover the war. And this is exactly the, the scenario. But my question, what local media has fed to you about the situation the country during the war, this is what matters. This is what matters. I, I understand that, but actually this is just an example but my question or my comment is in a, on a broader sense hmm. with the developed countries where the media freedom is supposed to be good are we really covering everything we should or are we going in the direction since the beginning of uh, middle east conflict and how much information through information yeah we talk about fake media but what about the other way the information is censored, of course, it depends, as I said, on the agenda and the editorials of the institution. Uh, but definitely a good journalism, responsible journalism that, you know, um, regards human rights and people's needs should really look into uh, humanitarian. It's not only about conflict, it's about people, how they live and so on, and their need as well. And as much as you reflect people's need as much you can succeed in your coverage uh, because you are not uh, creating f faking anything it's it's there you just need to see it you need to be sensitive to it uh, people in our region are very sensitive to conflict only they like trouble they're not sensitive to good things but also count your blessings huh? i mean in the u.s there's also still very good media i mean it's not all fox news or like in the <laughs> Russia, Sputnik or RT, you know, really awful media. You also have quality media. You still have the Washington Post, the New York Times. I mean, they also make mistakes. Uh, nobody's perfect, but uh, yeah, these are good outlets and there are more of that. In Holland, same thing. You have good quality newspapers here. Uh, in Western Europe, uh, yeah. I, I don't think you should be too negative about uh, the media situation uh, as it is. That's exactly what my question's about. Um, so. <laughs> I'm from the US, um, which is actually 45th for freedom in the Freedom Index. I just looked it up. Um, but the media is so polarized, and as someone who, watch, who watches you know, main networks, um, I often find it hard to find the facts. So as journalists, what are your suggestions for finding the truth um, amongst all the noise? <laughs> Select your news sources. <laughs> Make sure you, yeah, you check out the right or right. Uh, sources that are actually doing good journalism. What Nabil said is in Iraq is actually true everywhere in the world. Uh, you need to find out who are journalists who do their work in an ethical, a good way, who want to find out, I mean, not just cover what's happening, but also why is it happening, what are the facts. Uh -huh. That's what it's about. So, yeah, you have your own responsibility there as well to, yeah. to find, uh, there is no find out what's truth. good. There is no absolute No, so that's difficult. And I think <laughs> the, the thing is, um, okay, I think f the first thing is, if it sounds too ostentatious, it usually is, you know? So <laughs> that's the first thing. Um, and like you said, find the right, the right uh, reliable sources. The, but the reliable sources aren't always going to be right. So, you know, so there's that. And, um, and then find the fact checkers. So you have the fact checkers that check the reliable sources. So in that way, you can sort of go step by step into um, uh, being a critical consumer. But even if you do all of that, that doesn't mean you have found the truth. It's just a ver version of the truth that a, a bunch of people have agreed on. And it's been fact checked, so it's, it's reliable. But um, there's still always, like, like he said, your own responsibility in um, being critical about everything you take in. And, um, and uh, that is something that, I mean, that, that's just, you have to do that um, through all your news consuming. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Um, I think the f uh, concept of freedom of expression and uh, uh, freedom for the press are Western concepts in, in essence. Uh, of course, the whole world contributed one way or another. But uh, unfortunately, there are um, examples of extremes or um, unreasonable, unreasonable red lines uh, when it comes to freedom of information or freedom of expression or opinion in the West. And that these are usually highlighted when we try to influence other societies and promote uh, freedom of expression and all that. Uh, I mean, if we remember 9-11, um, what happened after that, if you remember, I mean, I was living in the UK and, um, and the Freedom of Information Act, I think, was put, put in a hall. I mean, okay, threat of terrorism, then it's an excuse to do anything. And that's what Erdogan is using in Turkey, and that's what many others uh, are using also. Uh, I mean, okay, I don't want to be too controversial to talk about the Holocaust and, and the right to talk about the Holocaust and all that. That's another red line that is also uh, not everybody. Agrees. I mean, I'm saying this because this is the defense that many people, I come from Libya, come from, uh, but I've been living in the world for a very long time. But I was working in Libya with Nabil, actually, <laughs> uh, after 2011. And, uh, and it's, people are just, um, you know, they, they don't want to accept that freedom of expression is a basic human right, uh, when, and they highlight examples uh, of this kind. Uh, I mean, just a very general comment about Iraq, which is similar to Libya in the sense that it's a petrodollar society, and there's a big problem with people uh, having money or earning money without doing much work. And when we work to develop the infrastructure for media, for journalism, uh, we faced uh, a problem because people don't have feel they have to work hard and earn uh, their living, uh, and they really uh, just not prepared to do what it takes to become a professional journalist. And of course, there are lots of obstacles about uh, working in this society, so there's no model that fits all when it comes to how to develop journalism or media in, in third world countries or Middle East, uh, as an example. Thank you. Can I comment on that? Yeah. I mean, I mean if, if human rights and, and ethics is seen as Western, if it's good, why not take it? So, why, <laughs> so what's, what's the problem? Honestly, I mean, why? Take the best out of the West. Yeah. So, <laughs> it's a good rhyme. <laughs> you know, you touch on something very important. Libya and Iraq, petro giants, right? And I now, I can challenge you if you can go and find one economical journalist who can write about economy and oil. Zero. <laughs> How do you see this? It's an opportunity. You know, you can write about economy and oil from now until the end of the days, and it will not put you in trouble. It will bring you more income. So also journalists can, can be smart about how they can, you know, approach things and how they can talk about things without putting themselves in trouble. Again, there is no story worth your life or your freedom. And as journalists, you have to really decide whether you publish or you don't publish, and you have to be the judge. At the end of the day, your freedom is worse than you know any any story that or any scoop. So uh, this is my recommendation. But also, uh, yeah, it's a bit of an insult actually. Western concept. I mean, there are excellent journalists all over the world. I mean, I have colleagues in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines, in Nairobi. Uh, yeah, who are from that con from these countries, and who are doing excellent yeah work. Uh, also for Human Rights Watch but also their networks. Uh, there are very, very good journalists who do excellent work. I mean, in Myanmar, you have two reporters who are now in prison, should be released immediately, uh, who and basically reported on a, a massacre by the, by the army. Uh, yeah. huh? Again, there you can also go online, find out uh, what you can do to get these people free. Reuters journalists, but local people, who did excellent work and yeah, should be free and not in prison. I was gonna say that too. I don't. I don't think it's a Western concept at all. I think I have a, a friend who's my age in in Liberia who's a journalist and we, you know, um, um, who's really passionate about her work and about about press freedom. Uh, I, I do think um, maybe there's a difference and maybe that's what you're trying to say that that Western jour journalism or media shouldn't be patronizing about the way we we strive for press freedom or the way we, we do the reporting. But I think that 
press freedom and, and, and uh, freedom of press in general is it's a universal thing. Yeah. I think that uh, our time is up. I think that's an appropriate note to end on too. We want to thank you for coming, but would you please thank our panelists for their contributions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.